Today, uh, there are times where uh, you're not supposed to be overly transparent, and I'm not real good about knowing when those are and when those aren't. But I will confess, not about water filters today, but my son asked me a question, my oldest son, and I, I tell you truly, church, when the boy moves off, I'm losing like 75% of my sermon example material. Yes. I really don't know what I'm going to do. I'm like, oh, I'm going to have to figure something out. But I was sitting across the dinner table from him. And we've had some interesting conversations as he's gotten older. And uh, I can't imagine, honest, no lie, I don't know what it's like to grow up as a pastor as a father. I don't know what it's like to grow up me as a father because I'm me. So I don't know what that's like. And he asked me a question. He asked his mother the same question. We're sitting there and he said, how do you know that God is hearing you? How do you know? Because I pray, but I don't, I don't feel it the same way you describe it. So how do you know? Now that was weeks ago that he said that, and he probably doesn't. I don't know how often he's thought that same question again, but his father has been marked by that question. For something that I know so certainly that my own son and my own church would have people in it that would ask the same question. The truth is, there was a time where I asked the same question. I remember sitting in a pastor's office, myself, trying to figure out what it meant to surrender to ministry. And I asked him much the same my son had asked me. How did you know that you knew? How do you know? You hear people talk about the Lord speaking to them, right? And I want to ask, what did that sound like? And it's so foreign to know exactly what somebody means when they say, I heard the Lord say, that there are some folks who say, no, I don't even think God speaks that way. I don't think, when somebody says they heard the Lord say something, I don't think that they heard God say anything, they just made a decision. And I'm very fond of being able to say that something happened and I knew the Lord was telling me. But what do I mean when I say that to you? When Abraham is being told to sacrifice his son, it says he heard the Lord. What did it sound like? Moses saw a burning bush that wouldn't be quenched with fire. And he heard a voice, the Bible says, Moses, take your Nikes off. What did it sound like? You know? How do you know that's the voice? And I have spent weeks in what quiet time I could find in my brain and I could get an agreement, asking God, you make everything clear in the Bible. Everything. But still today, I can't think of one place to tell my son to look, to tell him, look, this is where it explains that. Until I'm here with you now. And I want to look in one place with you. And oddly enough, I don't think it's irony but how funny it is that it's in the beginning of the Bible. And I'm digging through cover to cover, I would have said, and it's in the beginning. <laughs> it's right at the first. I want to look at a man named Jacob who did a lot of stuff wrong and how he came to learn that God was there even when he was completely unaware. Because when we're asking how you know something, sometimes what we need to be reminded of is, I don't necessarily need to know. Not in the way I might think I do. I don't need the 10-step plan for God's path that he wants me to walk. I just need to know that he has told me to take one step. And so I want to encourage you to turn to Genesis chapter 28 this morning. The beginning chapter of the, or the beginning book, rather, of the whole Bible, Genesis. In chapter 28... Where Jacob has been told by his father. Now, to, to give us some context, Jacob has a brother named Esau. They are twins. And the word Jacob is an interesting word in Hebrew that largely in English would be translated as trickster or liar. So, every time I meet somebody named Jacob, I'm like, I wonder if your parents knew what <laughs> Probably not. Liar, trickster. It means you 
usurper or heel grabber. And that meaning actually merited out in Jacob's behavior in the womb, where he grabs, the Bible tells us, what couldn't have been known, I guess, by the adults in the situation, but the Bible tells us that Jacob, as an infant, grabbed his brother's ankle, trying to trade spots with him as who was going to be born first. His brother's name is Esau. Means redheaded. Esau, the Bible says, is covered in hair, red hair. He's a hairy dude. Well, if you're familiar at all, or if you're not, I'm going to give you the what do they call those? Cliff Notes version of, of Jacob and Esau. Esau was guaranteed two things because he was born first. Even though they were twins and technically born at the same time, Esau is born first, and so he is given the privilege of being the one who would receive the birthright and the one that would receive the blessing of his father. Now this is established off of Isaac receiving the blessing from his father Abraham. And so the firstborn, the place of honor, Esau would have the birthright. Now what's the birthright? Simple version is he gets the largest sum of inheritance. Esau trades that to his brother Jacob for lunch. That's a totally different sermon. Then, some strange family dynamics go on because Esau is supposed to get the blessing of Isaac. He's supposed to have handed down to him the, the plan of God to see God's people established on earth. But Jacob's mom plays favorites and likes Jacob more than they like Esau. Esau is a hunter. He is rugged. He is a rough and tumble dude, and he's not beyond trading off his inheritance for stew. And Jacob's mother wants Jacob to receive the blessing, the patriarchal blessing it's known as. Now, parents, you know the number of times your kids, if you've had more than one, they said, who's your favorite? Well, Jacob's mom could lie and say neither, because she has a favorite. And so Isaac, the Bible tells us, is beginning the last days. He's basically blind, and he calls for Esau to bring him his favorite meal. And everybody in the house knows it's blessing time. Esau goes off to get what he needs to make that meal, and while he's gone, Mama says, Jacob, go get some animal skin and put it on you so that you'll feel hairy like your brother. That dude must have been real hairy. <laughs> and then I'll make the stew and you take it in there to your dad. He'll thank your Isaac. You'll get the, I mean, he'll thank your Esau. You'll get the blessing. Cha-ching. Weird family dynamic. Jacob does what his mama says. And I won't bore you, but if you were ever interested in doing some extracurricular Bible study, there is such an interesting point of view that Isaac knew he was being duped. He knew because of what he says. Come closer, let me touch you. You sound funny. Isaac, uh, anyway, I, 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 that's really interesting. But anyway, long story short, Jacob steals the blessing. Esau comes home. What just happened? And guess what he doesn't so much like his brother anymore. And he, he's, I'm going to kill you. And, uh, and so Jacob has to leave. And in doing so, Isaac has told Jacob, you're not going to take a wife from anybody around here. I want you to go to your grandpa's area. To your mama's father's land. I don't want you to find somebody out there. And Jacob does as he's been told. And that's where this Bible reference starts. Okay? It starts, Genesis 28, 1, starts with Jacob having been blessed by Isaac. And we're being reminded here that he was told, You shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. Rise, go to Paddan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, to your mother's father, and from there you will take a So he's telling him, go away from here to find a wife. That ties into <laughs> me telling my children to get on out of here. That's, that was, I'm saying, I'm being recorded, my wife wants to record me now, and so I'm saying that in the event I ever look back at this, how grateful I am that God instructed my Bible study here to be able to answer my son's question and my own question. Because I told my three children, get on out of here. Grow up and go. Spread your wings. Fly. Find what you need to find, but go. 
Not because I hate Louisville, I love Louisville. But I love Louisville. And I don't need them here because they think, oh, mom doesn't want me to leave. Well, if you gotta leave, you gotta go. If, you, if that's what you gotta do, you gotta do. Anyway, that was for me. Esau knows that Jacob's been blessed. There's some fussing, but I call your attention to verse 10. Jacob is gone. Jacob is on his own. And this is what you may have heard of in your life, the dream of Jacob's ladder. Verse 10 says, Then Jacob departed from Beersheba, and he went toward Haran. And he came to a certain place, and he spent the night there, because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of the place, and he put it under his head, and lay down in that place. And he had a dream. And behold, a ladder was set on the earth, with its top reaching to heaven, and behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it, and said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give it to you and to your descendants. And your descendants will also be like the dust of the earth. You will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. And in you and in your descendants shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you. And I will keep you wherever you go. And I will bring you back to this land. Because I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. This is the same sort of blessing that Abraham had received from God, that Isaac had received, and now God following the pattern, giving it to Jacob. And verse 16 suddenly stuck out to me like a sore thumb. Why, by the way, did Jacob camp here? Because it was night. The Bible doesn't say he felt some mystical power. The Bible doesn't say that as he was walking, something spoke to him and said, Hey, this is where you need to sleep tonight. He had no reason for stopping other than the Bible says he stopped because the sun had set. It was nighttime, so it was what? It was right to stop. He knew no great spiritual reason for this place. It's just dark now. And yet in his sleep, he sees the Lord, and he hears the Lord say to him what he had heard his father say, that his father had heard the Lord say. And that was what his grandfather had said, the Lord had said. And Jacob recognizes there's more here than just old Jacob. And he makes this statement. The Bible says he awoke from his sleep, and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I didn't know it. Surely God is in the middle of something and I didn't realize he was in the middle of it. I didn't know how to see him here. Now unless I am the only weird one here, every one of you has lived long enough, the majority of us in here anyway, to have been in some sort of situation where we thought, where could God possibly be in the middle of it? In the middle of some disaster, some destruction, some suffering, some sorrow, some trouble. Those moments where we cry, why is this the way it is? Is a different way of us saying, where could you possibly be in the middle of all this mess? When, can you believe, by the way, that in April it will have been six years ago that a tornado hit this community? Six Six years ago, I got asked on a continual basis, why would God let this happen? Why? And what we struggled with was being able to see God in the middle of destruction like that. Or at least that's what I stood out in the parking lot and struggled with. And I had the privilege of being out here where nobody else was, and I said, you have to, like I had that Ability, but that's just what I said. I said, you have to make this make sense. Because from down here, it makes none. Six years from then, I can look back at that tornado and say, surely God was in that. But at the 
time. I didn't know it. Now it makes you sound so spiritual and profound in the middle of some difficulty to be like, the Lord works in mysterious ways. I know he's got a plan for this. But while my mouth speaks that, what does my heart normally believe? My heart normally believes that that sounds good and I wish I could believe it. That when it's constantly being broken, when it's constantly being ripped apart, when there's so much difficulty, when there's so much uncertainty, I want to say, but God is doing something. I just don't know what. And I'm not lying. There are people that when they say that, they believe that and you see them differently. But there have been plenty of times in my life where I've said that out loud, but on the inside, I wish I could believe this. It's the power of hindsight that lets me look back and say, God was in that. I just didn't know it. There's a quote I wanted to read, and it's in Old English because it's from the 19th century. It's a man named Frederick Hosmer. He's a hymn writer, and he was a Unitarian pastor in the, in the middle of the 19th century. And he wrote and said, O thou, God, in all of thy might so far, in all of thy love so near, beyond the range of the sun and star, yet you are beside us. When I read that, I, I wondered, can we sometimes get caught up focusing on how big God is that we forget he has decided to be right here with me very small? That yes, indeed, he is larger than all of creation. That in just his hand is the entire universe. God is magnificent beyond my comprehension. And even so, he is right here with me in whatever I'm going through right now. So in the midst of your marriage, is it possible that God is there and you don't realize it? In the midst of your struggle with some situation that to others may be nameless but to you very real, is it possible that God is in that? You just don't recognize. Is it at all possible that sometimes what we suffer with most is what Jacob had the privilege of learning? He was here the whole time. I just didn't know. Because there are some things about that smallness of God, and Lord forbid that you misunderstand, I am not calling God small. But think about how little that magnificent God is when he's here with me. How focused down, I guess. The expanse of the sun and star don't encompass God, and yet here he is written down here. But there are some things I need to know about him so that I don't get tempted to think he's not here. You, I, you've probably seen it before. If you, you take letters and don't put any spaces, I, I guess I, if I was smart, I could have put this where it come along. You, 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 if you've got a pencil and paper, you can write down. And when, you, when I say this, you'll be like, oh, yeah, I've seen that. You type G. O D I S N O W H E R E. But you smash all those letters together. This would make a ton of sense if I had it on the wall. <laughs> G O D I S N O W H E R E. In a moment, you look at that and you see the words God is nowhere. But if you break it in a different way, it says God is now. Here. That's the journey Jacob took in that one night. And it's the journey that some of us are on right now. Learning that it isn't true that God is nowhere. It's true that he's here. Number one, this God that's always here is never failing. And we don't know anything else like it. In Deuteronomy 31, 6, I, I read as I kept studying, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or tremble. For the Lord your God is the one who goes with you. He will not fail you. And he will not forsake you. So when somebody asks, Can you actually put all of your hope and all of your trust in God? Yes. Because he will not. He cannot fail you. It is not, it's in my nature to fail you. Don't believe me? 
we just have to ask the right people. And they'll be like, yep. Ask my parents if I was perfect. Ask my wife if I've been perfect. Ask my children if I'm perfect. Now they're going to say yes because they don't want to get grounded. <laughs> but everybody that's going to tell the truth, ask people in this community where I've done either knowingly because I couldn't or unknowingly because I had no idea. I will fail. The Bible doesn't say, hey, God's pretty good at not failing. The Bible testifies over and over again, he can't. God can't fail you. So when he says to you, just trust me, it's not, I hope you can trust me. It's not, I've done enough good to earn your trust. You just got to overlook the bad. God says, I'm the only one that cannot fail you. And then let me remind you of what we just read in Genesis when he's giving the promise to Abraham. I mean, when he gave it to Abraham, the promise being repeated to Jacob. I will not leave until I've done what I told you I would do. The last statement God makes, I will not leave you until I have done what I promised you. In other words, I'm not going anywhere until I'm done. What does that have to do with Jacob? Who is being relied on? He doesn't say, I won't leave until you decide you don't want me anymore. I will not go anywhere until I'm finished, God says. He says, I don't promise the way other people promise. I don't plant seeds and hope they grow. My word, he says, never comes back to me unless it does what I say it's going to do. I don't leave unless I'm finished. Now, I want to ask you, have you ever left before you were done? Can you say in your daily life, from the time of birth to the time of now, that you've always left it on the field and there's never anything where you're like, because you can't judge God with my heart. I have to judge my heart with his heart. And how do I know that God is here when I don't know that he's here? Because the scripture promises me that he doesn't fail. And he promised that he would be here. But it also promises that he'll never go anywhere. Now this is the one that bothers me the most. I've confessed time and time again my ignorance on multiple things, multiple things. And one of the things I am dumbest about, well, I don't know if I can say that because who knows, that's a long list. I'm real dumb about cars, like vehicles. I'm 41, and if I go into an auto zone, I get an anxiety problem. Because I assume that everybody in there thinks that I know what I'm talking about, and I'm the guy that's like, I don't know, it just doesn't work. Well, well, what's it doing? Not working? I mean, I don't know. You know, I still, there's been plenty of times when they lived in Memphis that I took my cell phone and said, Dad, the car's doing this, and turned the key and held it up so he could hear some version of click, 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 or whatever. And he'd say, sounds like your battery. Okay. Where's that? And, and then I see people working on the car, and they're like touching stuff. I'm like, how do you know that's not going to electrocute you? I mean, I don't know. Did, did you know you can touch the posts on a car battery and it doesn't shock you? Did you know that? I didn't know that. So I go buy a battery at Walmart and I'm carrying it like this. <laughs> Which, by the way, takes a great deal of shoulder strength. <laughs> but I'm not touching those two things. And then you should see this dude out in his driveway trying to put those attachments on the posts with the end of a screwdriver. Like, <laughs> and it's a rubber-handled screwdriver. But I'm like, because <laughs> I'm not touching it. I'm not touching. This is, doesn't that, doesn't that, I don't like that. I don't like it. I don't like it, okay? So when I get in a car and it doesn't start, you have to understand, the whole of my mental comfort is just washed away. Because I don't sort of know what to do. I don't know what to do. And have you ever noticed that your car only doesn't start when you really need to go somewhere? Now, that, the, the reason that is, because the only reason you know it doesn't start is because you're trying to go somewhere. But it's only when you are in an absolute emergency trying to get somewhere that doesn't do anything. And there have been times where I have said, no lie, what a baby. God, why are you forsaking me right now? Over a car battery. 
let's be clear, there are people receiving terminal illness diagnoses today. There are people that are going to starve to death today. There are people going through foreclosure on their home. There are people watching a loved one pass from this life to the next. All sorts of stuff, but God has forsaken this guy because he let my car battery die. You see, that's an incorrect understanding of where God is always, because God is always with you. He does not leave. Isaiah 41.10, do not be afraid. By the way, it struck me how every time God says this, there's some reference to not having fear. Do not be afraid. I am always with you. Don't be anxious. Don't look around, because I am God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you by my righteous right hand. In Isaiah 43, 2. When you go through the waters, I will be with you. And though there are rivers, they will not overflow you. In other words, you're not going to drown. When you walk through fire, you won't be scorched, and the flame will not burn you. Again, an idea of no fear because God is there. And Jesus gives the most terrifying instruction of all of them at the end of the book of Matthew. Now it's what everybody's heard. Matthew 28, 19 and 20, 18 through 20. Go therefore, all power has been given me in heaven and on earth. You know the great commission. You've heard some recited version of it. Go therefore, make disciples of all people, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them everything I have commanded you. He tells them the most frightful thing because he's saying, leave home. Go do it. And I won't be there with you physically. Like, you won't see me. You ever noticed how you're more willing to do something when somebody else is there to do it with you? You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, especially if it's something, like, out of the ordinary. Like, you know what? I ain't taking a chemistry test today. Somebody's like, yeah, me neither. She can't give it to us if we all say we're not going to do it. Yeah, you're right. All right. After break today, we're going to tell the chemistry teacher, we're not taking that test, right? Yeah, yeah. Everybody's pumping their chest. Yes, yes, yes. And so the break ends. Do, 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 do. You go up there and you turn around and nobody's with you. Are you still going to talk to the chemistry teacher? No. Nah. You walk downstairs like, I guess I'm taking the test. So imagine the disciples watching Jesus prepare to ascend to heaven. And he says, now you go do it. I'm out. And he promises a comforter, and I'm not trying to ignore the Holy Spirit. I'm just saying, they've done it with him standing there, and now he says, go do it, and I won't be standing there. That's terrifying. And if you don't agree with me that it's terrifying, when's the last time you shared the gospel with somebody? It terrifies you, doesn't it? I don't want to talk. What if I say something wrong? I don't know what to say. What if they ask me a question? I don't know. We got all these reasons why we don't say it. It is terrifying. The Great Commission is terrifying. How does he end the Great Commission? Listen, he says. Lo, old translation. Lo, I am with you forever. Even until the end of the age. That's a fancy way of saying, until the end of time, I'm with you. So what scares you? Were you scared when you could see me? I'm still there. I am never leaving you, God says. Why is it important to remember that God said he would never leave? Because life wants you to think you're alone. Life wants you to think you have been left. And I, and I see the blessing that this congregation has of so many little, little people. And I wish in my heart there was a way for us to keep them from having to learn that you're going to feel left. But you are. That's a part of human life. Which is why so many times, I think, God says throughout the Old and New Testament, I will never leave. I do not sleep. I do not rest. I am not a man. I'm not going anywhere. I'm telling you, when you're sitting back in your easy chair and everything's fine and all your bills are paid and the refrigerator is not squirting water everywhere, it's easy to believe that God is with you, isn't it? But when you're neck deep in mud and you've just learned something about a relationship you thought was okay and it's not okay, or you've just learned something about someone and they're in dire need and you can't nor 
or do you know how to help them? Or something's happened, something tragic, something that people would say has upset your apple cart? Now it's harder to receive that. That God is saying, I am right here. But how can I know that? How can I be so certain of that? Well, because I believe. I know that the answer to my son's problem is not one I can give him. The answer to Tanner's question is an answer God has to give him. I know that God is always there because I believe him. Believe what he says. And I believe that when he says he is not a failing God, he's not going to fail. And I believe that when he says he's never going to leave me, he's not going to leave me. And I have life experience where that belief was tested. And like Jacob, I can look back even when I didn't believe it at the time and say, God was there. I didn't know it. Something happened over this summer. And I was so certain it was going to go a certain direction. It didn't go that direction. Occasionally, I can be a cowie baby. She's doing her best not to shake her head yes. I, that's, that's a godly woman. I can be real cowie. And so when this thing didn't go the way I thought it was going to go, I'm pretty sure I was cowie. God was there, I didn't know it. Because now when I look back at that thing, oh, Jesus, thank you. You knew exactly what you were doing. And I didn't. God was there. I didn't know it. Because he won't fail, he won't leave, and I'm going to give you my favorite one. He doesn't let go. You know, I love action movies, you know? And you ever notice they do superhuman things in action movies because it would be boring if it was just a regular old Joe. And, and so some guy got, like, pulled the entirety of another grown man's weight in one arm. He's like, don't worry, I got you. And they're hanging off a helicopter, you know? And then he's like, Ugh! and this steroid-riddled <laughs> bicep pokes out. Ugh! And he pulls up the weight of an entire man with just one arm. I don't think that's physiologically possible, but it looks awesome. You know, and he gets him in the helicopter, you know? I told you I would never let go. And then you see other movies, the guy's like, I got you, I got you. And he, and he drops it. Like, what? Huh. You said you weren't going to let go. Well, when God says he has you, and then he has given you the privilege to hear him say, I will never I just tell you a secret. That means no matter how far you wander in your head and wander with your heart, God has never let you go. Those whom I hold in my hand can in no way be snatched out, he says. Again, looking to Isaiah 41, verse 13. I am the Lord, your God, who upholds your right hand, who says to you, do not be afraid. I will help you. The image that Isaiah is being told to draw in his language is that God, okay, so you might know that the Israelites fight a battle at one time, and Moses is told to stand with his rod and keep his hands up. And the whole time he keeps his hands up, Israel wins in the fight. And then, if you've ever tried that, eventually you get tired of holding your arms up. And so as his arms were get coming down because he's older and he can't hold his arms up, Israel would start losing. The whole time his hands are up, they're winning. The whole time his hands are down, they start to lose. And in the reality of that, people come alongside Moses and hold his arms up for him, and then Israel wins the day. 
Well, in Isaiah, in the mess that Israel has gotten herself into, the northern kingdom, God is saying, I'm the one who's holding your hand up. And what did hands up mean in that story? Victory. So what is God saying about holding your hand up? You will always be winning with me. I uphold your hand. I am holding your hand up so that you will have victory. Don't be afraid. I will help you. See, it's not, it's not Mason holding you outside the helicopter. Don't worry, I got you. I mean, I can say that, but the minute my arm muscles are like, no, we ain't got them anymore, you're gone. But you see, God, that one who is bigger than the sun and the stars, the one who holds the expanse of all creation in his hand, he says, think about what is holding my hand up to him. And he says, but I got you. And I will hold your hand up. You start combining all this stuff together. God says, I got your hand up. You will have victory. And I will never leave and let that hand go. And I will never fail in holding my hand up. Because like I told Jacob, I will finish what I started with you. I will not let you go. Whether you know I'm holding you or not. There's been things that have happened in the past 10 years that I have had the privilege of watching happen and had not the slightest clue of what to do. In all of them, I said, I prayed that God would show Tanner why I know what I know. So I'm going to tell you what God did and let you decide whether God had done it. Tanner has every choice on the planet in front of him. And see, this is another thing I don't know about uh, being a preacher's son or my son. Your business is laid out before everybody on Louisville's community, right? And I remember asking Becky it, during seminary, I took a, a counseling class, and the professor said, don't you ever stand up and talk about your wife unless you've got her permission first. Well, I went home, I had a two-hour drive home, and I called her, and I was like, I need blanket approval to say whatever I want, because I'm going to forget to ask you. And she's like, okay, I don't care. Well, I never ask my kids, because they're minors, and I don't care. You know, I do it all. That's not but now he's 18. I should have asked permission, but I think this is glorious. I think Tanner's biggest trouble right now is he's got every choice in the world. He's just afraid of making one. Can you remember that? You know the thing about growing up is you realize there was no magic moment where you knew everything to do. You just kept trying to figure it out as you went along. And he's learning that now. He's got to make certain decisions and put off certain things, and so now it's piled up. And that's the disease of procrastination always coming back. I know exactly what that feels like. I mean, Lord, I, I've been in school the majority of my entire existence, not just my adult life, and I'm sitting back there in my office, two steps from a doctorate, and I tell my wife, I don't care anymore. I'll, I'll quit. I don't want to, I don't want to do it. I mean, I, I understand about I'm just giving up. We had a long conversation. I told him I believed in it. Got to choose. And so it was a little discouraging. We want to go into the Air Force, we think. You know, we're pretty sure on that one. We've flip flopped around. The Marines had offered an immediacy, but the Marines are the Marines. And let's be honest, you know, I ain't trying to get Marineized. Maybe, maybe not. We don't know. Now I'm going to go to the Air Force, okay. But his recruiter won't contact him. I was like, that's fine. Fine. I don't care. They got a recruiter in Columbus. Let's call her. We're not tied to this man in Meridian. I don't care. I said, but give him one last shot. Text him and say, hey, sir, I'm still working towards this. Is there anything I need to be doing? I haven't heard from you in a while. Because this is February that we're having this conversation, and we haven't heard from this guy since December. And just so happens we have filled out that job application at Chick-fil-A that day. And the lady said, we, we, we run a report on these applications every two weeks. Well, that's discouraging. I want a job right now. I've got to wait two weeks before you even look at my application to say no. I was like, I don't care. Fill it out. A little headache at home. Leads to 
this conversation. So I go downstairs to Mama and I'm like, okay, here's what I just talked to Tanner. Here's what we talked about. And I hope for this boy, he's going to be okay. You know, we just got to work it out. We got to work it out. And he comes to, to my bedroom door. And, he, and he's holding his telephone. And it's not like at this moment, all of a sudden, the Jesus music starts playing in the background. It's not like I hear it echoing through the house. This is the time, Mason. No. I do what I always do when somebody's standing at my door. What? And he's holding his telephone and he says, I'm not lying. I didn't text the recruiter. But after you left my room, the recruiter texted me to ask how I was doing. And I just got an email from Chick-fil-A that says they want me to come in for an interview because they're going to give me a job. All I could do was put my hand on his shoulder, and I started crying like a baby, but I held it together like I'm trying to hold it together right now. And I said, son, if you can't see that now, you're not looking. You see, he does. What are you going to do? Because how? I don't believe in coincidence in the first place. But I, I would need somebody to explain to me how it just so happens that after this conversation that I have with my son in his room would end with a man who hasn't bothered to contact my son in two months, texts him right then, and in the place that said that it would be two weeks before they responded, emails him right then and says, you're hired. You tell me how that happens, other than looking at it and saying, God was there, and I didn't know it. Because I wasn't sitting in his room, having a conversation with a young man, and thinking, God is working this out right now. God is mixing, the, mixing it up. Some, I didn't think that. I thought what a parent thinks. We just got you. But he came down to my room and he said, here's what just happened. And I thought to myself, you were there. I didn't know. Glory be to God. Because the greatest lie of them all is that you're alone. Whether you think you're alone in your suffering, or you think you're alone in your sin, you think you're alone in your struggle. You think you're alone in any aspect of life. The lie of the devil is, you're right, you're on your own. And that lie is so loud that then we look and wonder, how can you know that God is there? When God himself has said, I So what's it mean? What's it mean to trust this? It means I might kneel down, but I never fall. I might have to put my hands on the ground. You know, you, I might have to, I might have to put one knee down and break from these push-ups. I might have to set the bar down on those squats. I didn't make it to ten that time. I don't, whatever metaphor you're going to use, you might have to kneel, but you don't fall. Because somebody's holding my hand up. Whether you look in Psalm 16 or Psalm 62, it's so beautiful, David repeats himself over and over again. But some of you might look at Psalm 16, 8. Some of you might look at Psalm 62, 2. But both times, David says this, I have set the Lord continually before me, and because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. I won't fail. Because someone else is holding my hand up. And he is there, whether I see him there now or not. That's the answer to the question that I can't answer. So how do you know that God is there? How do you know? The simplest thing. those with 
eyes and look to the Lord, you can't help but see it. Because what Jacob says is true. You're there. I didn't know. And I pray for you and for me, for all of these little ones coming behind us, that they learn <coughs> from us how to see. So that as they grow beyond us, Trusting the one who never fails, never leaves, and never lets go. I will not be shaken. You are there. God loved the world. And where did he send his son? Here. Here. I pray that you see him. Smallest place. Let's pray together. God, I'm so.